thank you for allowing me to share during this time. I think one of the challenges that I have in doing a presentation like this is that I spend most of my teaching time in a voice lesson or in a choir rehearsal where I'm simply reacting to and responding to a situation. Uh, shape this vowel like this, let's do this, this rhythm is a little, uh, maybe this is quicker. And I don't spend as much time in creating content, so I will say that one of the challenges I have in doing this is that I'm now creating content. But what I'm gonna to share today is really a collection of essays. Some of these I've had to write for church newsletter articles. Once I even prepared um, this uh, talk for our church music workshop at one of our Baptist institutions over in Missouri. And so I've entitled this Lessons Learned in Music Ministry. In November 1994, I began my music ministry journey. I started at a small church in Georgetown, Mississippi. You probably never heard of it. Um, it was 70 miles away from William Carey University where I was a college student. I would go up on uh, Sundays. I was their part-time minister of music and youth. The nearest fast food was 15 miles away. So the church had a, a list every day that was the feed bin list. And there was this one particular um, person, her first name was June. She made the best vegetable soup I have ever eaten to this day. Sorry, mom. All right. 26 years later, I know that God has taught me some important lessons along the way that I needed to write down. Perhaps they could uh, help out a freshly called minister of music and give them encouragement, or maybe it could give encouragement to a battered ministry veteran. I once read an interesting quote by the country comedian Jeff Foxworthy. He said that wisdom equals knowledge plus scars. God called me into ministry at age 15. Our youth group was at a, a youth camp at Ridgecrest Assembly Center in Asheville, North Carolina. And the speaker that night was talking about the call to full-time ministry. And I'm sitting by my best friend, uh, Todd. We'd grown up together and gone to school together. And both of us went down, not knowing the other one went down. But I felt God calling me to a life of Christian service. I had no idea what that meant at age 15. Later, I would share that decision in my home church of uh, Liberty Baptist Church in Mississippi. My college studies began at a community college, and then I graduated from there, transferred over to William Carey College to study church music. Unbeknownst to me, I would also meet my wife at William Carey. We were not married at the time. I, you know, I did. Never mind. All right. I was the nerdy kid who sat in the front of the theory classroom and asked questions. She sat in the back of the room and made fun of the kids in the front who asked questions. <laughs> And she would also say I had a bad haircut at the time. Oh, well. <laughs> Later, she admitted to me that she felt as if God wanted her to marry a minister of music. I graduated from Cary in uh, May of 1996, and two weeks later, Rebecca and I married. She was working on her music ed degree, and I began commuting to New Orleans uh, Seminary, and the commute was 100 miles one way. In the summer of 97, we answered a call to serve a church in Picayune, got us a little closer to New Orleans. Um, I was the minister of music and senior adults. It is worth noting that I was the minister of music to, and senior adults, but I was not old enough to drive the church van for insurance purposes, <laughs> so that when I took a senior adult trip, they had to drive. A little humbly, but anyway. Ten years passed, or two years passed, and I accepted a call to be a full-time minister of music at Oak Park Baptist Church in New Orleans. By this time, I had finished my master's degree and felt compelled to tackle a doctoral degree in church music. And upon completion of my coursework, I fell into what I call the black hole of the dissertation. Upon completion, um, or as I was nearing the completion of uh, my dissertation, one of my profs called me in his office and said, hey, there's a church in, or there's a college in South Georgia, a little Baptist school. They need somebody to teach voice and teach church music. Next thing I know, I'm there in uh, August of 2005. <laughs> So while I was teaching, I stayed engaged in music ministry on an interim basis. And I began uh, interim work that would take me an 80-mile an journey two times a week. So 160 miles round trip twice a week. I would On Wednesdays, I would get home at 11 at night. We had small children in the house. It was pretty tough. Um, 
So I did one year interim at a church in Cordial, then a three and a half year interim at First Church of Perry, which is in central Georgia. That's important to the story somehow. And in December of 2009, my teaching job at Bruton Parker came to an abrupt halt. And at that point, I joined the faculty of Troop Connell College in January of 2010. I taught there for five and a half years uh, before joining the, the faculty here. Um, I now serve as an um, interim minister of music or uh, part-time minister of music over at Gamble Street. And so in September 2014, I was asked to write a one-page devotional for the church music uh, email newsletter. And so I accepted that offer and penned a devotional on my favorite hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And today, while I was talking to Matt Sykes, I decided I should have included that devotional. So I quickly had to scour my computer and find it and plop it in here. After that devotion, I felt compelled to write down these life lessons that God has taught me in 26 years of music ministry. These lessons fall into four categories, music ministry, relationships, life, and family. Some of the lessons were gleaned from local church music ministry. A few were uh, gleaned from 15 years of teaching college, and then others from family life. My first uh, lesson from music ministry is invest energy into congregational singing. Now, I know that you take several classes in that kind of thing, but I'm just going to give you a few thoughts. Teach people to sing their faith. I say this statement all the time, and I really don't remember where I even read it or heard it. Colossians 3.16 comes to my mind as I ponder what it means to teach people to sing their faith. <clears throat> Ministers of music and worship leaders have been given an incredible task to lead the church in song. We hear music around us each day in our cars, through earbuds on our iPhone, in the grocery store, etc. In church, we gather together as the body of Christ to sing to God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching people to sing their faith assumes that the leader has a solid grasp of scripture and theology. We're not working as a local radio DJ, uh, radio station DJ. We are selecting songs that reinforce what we believe about Christ. I have three degrees in church music. That sentence alone makes me tired. That was supposed to be funny. My studies included a lot of applied voice and piano study, but the bulk of my work was in church music. And each time I sit down to plan a worship service, I'm asking or I'm wrestling with this thought, what am I teaching God's people about their faith in the songs that I select for worship? There's a quote from Randall Bradley, uh, from memory to imagine, and from memory to imagination. Worship is, an, is the act in which God changes us. We come to worship to engage with God and submit our brokenness to God, who can heal us and make us whole. The second thing I would, lesson I've learned is youth choir is rewarding. Reclaim it. As a teenager in my home church, I sang in youth choir. Every Sunday, we would gather for youth choir, then we'd have supper, then we'd have church training union or whatever it was called, and then we would sing in the worship service. We sang the normal fare of youth musicals of that day. The musical that sticks out in my mind is Dennis and Nan Allen's Live It to the Max. 1987 was a great year. My mom has a video of this musical with the stonewashed jeans and the rolled, you know, you rolled up the leg, but you don't know, you weren't there, and all the big hair. I can still sing some of the songs from that musical years later. 25 years later, I found myself on a music faculty with Dennis Allen. As I was serving Roseland Park Baptist Church, 97 to 99, I began to delve into youth choir ministry. One of my friends right across town at a bigger church had a hundred kids in his youth choir. They wouldn't fit in his choir room. And I, I couldn't even imagine that. I started attending every youth choir concert that I could. The Mississippi Baptist All State Youth Choir was uh, flourishing during that time, still is. And I went and heard a local concert they were giving. I went and heard concerts at uh, my friend's church there when his youth choir came back from tour. I didn't have that much success in that church, but later on, I, as I moved to my church in uh, New Orleans, I stumbled upon a book called Revealing Riches and Building Lives. Youth Choir Ministry in the New Millennium, a book by youth choir veteran Randy Edwards. I highly suggest that book. This book had a profound impact on my music ministry, and I consider it a must-read. 
Edwards talks about the musical soundtrack of our lives. He emphasizes the importance of teaching youth anthems that are based on scripture text with solid choral music. The teaching potential is powerful. I was eager to build a youth choir in this church. I tried to pour every ounce of energy into youth choir. During six years, our, our youth choir performed a Christmas musical. We put on two Christmas dinner theater programs. We attended the Lifeway event Sun Power. We did that twice. We participated in four youth Q festivals and went on three regional tours. On our tour to Chicago, we even sang at a medium security detention center for juvenile males. We also sang in weekly worship services in New Orleans for associational meetings and gave concerts in local churches. Once I began teaching in college, I found it a little more difficult to, to invest this much time in youth choir. However, while I was an interim in Perry, um, our adults and youth choir joined for Dan Goler's The Word Became Flesh. Anytime you can combine adult and youth choirs, it is a win-win. I was, um, in my time in Georgia, I got to do some Georgia Baptist All-State Youth Choir events. Those were very, very fruitful. In my time at my current church at Gamble Street, I've taken our youth choir to the Baylor Youth Q Festival for five years running. And um, it's been a joy to see my, my two children, now both in the youth group, uh, involved in that as well. Youth choir is one of the hardest things I've ever done. It takes a lot of work, time, and resources. It can be discouraging at times. Some folks think, will think you're even crazy for trying it. Don't listen to them. Invest in youth choir. Youth are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church today. My passion for youth choir feeds my drive and my work with adult choirs in church. Um, taking our youth choir to the Youth Q festivals has been transformational for me in music ministry. The next lesson, scripture guides worship if you will allow it. I love reading scripture as a part of our congregational worship. In a church where I was in 07, 2007 to 2010, we would begin every morning worship service with a psalm, and then at the end, we would read one of Paul's uh, benedictions, my favorite being 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24, and then 28. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will also bring it to pass. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's a powerful way to end a service. In our worship planning, we allow worship to be the bookends of the service. In my current church, we read a psalm each week, or at least a, a psalm or a portion of a psalm, an Old Testament scripture and a New Testament scripture in worship. And at one point, I counted up how many of those we had done, and it one point I said we had done 38, and I know that's much greater um, years later. Psalm 25, four through five reads, make me know your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, for you I wait all the day. When you skip over to verses 20 through 21, guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. As a singer, I love to hear people sing in worship. As a worship leader, I love to read scripture together. The sound of the human voice reading scripture together is a powerful thing in worship. Don't overlook it. And then the last of the lessons from music ministry, I had to trim this down for time. Allow a hymn text to permeate your life. This is the devotional I had to go back and find, and I found it a couple hours ago. Tune my heart. One of my favorite hymns since childhood is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The hymn begins with these precious words, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. I've invested a great amount of time and energy trying to help others learn to sing in tune. In order for a choir to sing in tune, they must listen and understand to what they're tuning. The hymn writer is asking God to tune my heart to sing thy grace. Each day as I pray through my prayer list, I make sure that I pray for my pastor as he shepherds the flock. A few years ago in a previous church, my pastor asked me to do something that I did not like. And to be honest, I must say I bristled 
like a porcupine. <laughs> he didn't know it, but I, I bristled. Tune my heart. Wait, I'm singing too loudly and not listening. Up to this point, I had not been praying for my pastor like I should. I've discovered that as I pray for him each day that I don't bristle each time he asks me to change something in the worship service. Tuning my voice is one thing, but tuning my heart requires much more effort on my part. Recently, I've had conversations with friends who are struggling with work relationships or problems with church members, and sometimes I simply say, are you praying for this person or this situation? It is surprising how many people answer no. Where does our spiritual tuning occur? Henry Nguyen said, Solid, solitude is the furnace for which transformation takes place. Tuning happens in our quiet time with Jesus. It happens over a period of time. It is developed and nurtured. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. I was once quizzed on this in chapel in front of the entire student body. The word Ebenezer is from 1 Samuel 7, 12, and literally means a stone of help, a memorial of what God has done in someone's life. For the past 25 years, I've committed, 25, 30 years, I've committed to keeping a prayer journal. I'll talk about it later. I was inspired by my best friend in college um, as I observed him writing in a prayer journal each day. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. If I'm not surrendering daily to the Holy Spirit, I must confess that I am prone to wander. There's some major gaps in those prayer journals that demonstrate my wandering. My intonation was poor as well. The end of that hymn text says, Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. In the choir, tuning and listening are both intentional and constant. When I sing louder than I listen, I simply cannot tune to the heart of the Father. When I'm in tune with God, I will, be, I will learn to be in tune with others. Then and only then, I can sing His grace. Lessons from relationships. This one is very closely connected to the last one, but I'm going to read it anyway. Here's where the scars come in. Pray for your fellow staff. Pray through your work relationships. Relationships are messy. I've heard that church work would be great if it weren't for the people. Conflict resolution is one of the hardest things that I've ever dealt with in ministry. It is, painful. It is a painful necessity indeed. Just because you serve on a church staff with someone does not mean you're not going to experience conflict. You must bathe staff relationships in prayer every day. Unfortunately, this is a lesson that I have learned uh, closer to the 20-year mark. Early on in ministry, I had some issues arise with the church staff, especially the pastor. And instead of praying for the situation each day and seeking the Lord's wisdom, I decided to take the human approach, criticism. And then I recently learned the importance of praying for my pastor. In the first couple of years in my current or in my ministry position, <laughs> one back, I have to admit that I was not diligently praying for my pastor. We decided to meet for lunch and discuss some ministry issues. He asked me to change the way I did something in the worship service, and again, I bristled. He didn't notice, but I was not happy. I got over it eventually and decided to pray for him each day as I pray for our church. A couple of years later, he asked me to make a substantial change in the music ministry. He asked me to move adult choir rehearsal from Wednesday night to Sunday afternoon. Since I'd been praying for him each day, I did not bristle this time. Without prayer preparation, that conversation would have ended very poorly. Why did it take me nearly 20 years to learn this lesson? I find it harder to argue with people for whom I pray regularly. If I know that I have to have a difficult conversation with someone, I want to pray about it as much as possible beforehand. When we don't pray through these situations, we might as well take a club with us. I don't suggest that, by the way. My next lesson is don't send that email. I actually wrote this a few days ago. <laughs> I actually, I seriously wrote this. Years ago, I served as a youth ministry intern. We would take this huge youth group, 60 to 70 teenagers on trips during the summer. And our youth minister had this one overarching rule. He called it 
the 3D rule. If there's a doubt, don't do it. It's a pretty good rule for life. Years ago, I attended a youth choir festival with my choir, and I was in the middle of doctoral studies at the time. And for this particular festival, the coordinator decided to bring in a guest conductor. Not sure why, but he did. And I was not particularly happy with this conductor's performance over the weekend. And so when I got back home, I sent a scathing email to the person in charge. In this same email, I said some pretty awful things about this conductor's inability to perform up to the task, in my opinion. After all, our church had spent a considerable amount of money on this experience. Looking back, I realized I should not have sent that email. Today, when I'm sending an email that I'm really not sure about, I follow a very simple rule. At the top of your email, it has a thing that says to, where you put an email address. You just don't fill it in. Just leave it blank. Then type your email. And keep typing. Because if you hit send, actually, it won't go anywhere. <laughs> if you find yourself typing so hard into the keyboard that you're going through your desk, don't send that email. My dad always told me, you can't unring a bell. You can't take those words back. James 1, 19 and 20 reminds us, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I'm sure James was talking about email when he said this. <laughs> In your ministry, you will have those days when somebody makes you so angry you could chew broken glass. Don't do that, by the way, anyway. Don't send that email. What happens when your supervising pastor sends you an abrupt text asking you to comply immediately? Don't send that text in anger. I've learned over the years, we can't control how other people um, treat us. We can, however, control how we react. Think about social media today. In today's vitriolic social media culture, there seems to be no self-control when a person attempts to drag someone else online. I love what Dr. Greenway says, it's okay to have an unexpressed thought. Don't send that email. It could cost you your job, your ministry, your livelihood. Choose your hill to die on very carefully. And oh, by the way, you only get one. Lessons from life. Be a lifelong learner. I remember the day, first day my son Clay went to kindergarten. We asked him, you know, how, he, how it was and great. He says, you know, it's great. He enjoyed the first day, but he could not understand why he would have to go back the second day. <laughs> I've already been. <laughs> I was in school from the first grade, age six, until I wrapped up my terminal degree around age 31. Sigh. <laughs> I started teaching college three months later. And while I was writing my dissertation, I was technically not in class anymore, but I was still doing voice lessons. As I began teaching college, I quickly realized I did not know everything that I needed to stay on top of my game. I use this illustration. It's like when you're in, um, when you graduate with your, um, or when you're in school, it's like you're in a, um, in a pond, very small pond, small body of water. And in that pond, you've learned to fish in it. You've even swam in it. You've canoed in it. You've played in it. You know everything that's in it. You've watched ducks and all the wildlife. And then when you graduate with a doctoral degree, somebody takes you out in a rowboat into the Gulf of Mexico and sends you adrift where you can no longer see any land. And you realize, oh, I really thought I knew something. It turns out I, hmm. In August of 2009, I participated in voice experience in Orlando and was able to study voice with the famous Verity Baritone, Cheryl Milnes. In the span of a week, I had daily voice lessons and vocal coaching sessions and rehearsals with a companist. The purpose of the voice camp was to prepare singers for auditions in opera and musical theater. I took the course simply to sharpen my skill set. I remember having to audition for this, this thing in front of my students. I got up and sang Il Mio Tesoro from Don Giovanni, great tenor aria. So um, at the very beginning of the opera, um, 
Don Giovanni has run his sword through the commandant, and that is um, Donna Anna, Donna Anna's um, uh, dad. And um, Ottavio is is trying to woo her, and so he sings his revenge aria. So I get up and I sing my very best and convince her that I had done this role. I had not done that role. I had sang that aria. And she worked with this, this person worked with me in front of my students. Now you want to talk about something that'll make you nervous. You get up and have a master class performed on you in front of your students. So anyway, so I, that catapulted me in the experience. Students learn best from teachers who continue to learn. When Pablo Casals, age 93 at the time, was asked why he continued to practice Bach's cello um, suites three hours a day, he replied, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. <laughs> Look him up. Ministers of music must continue to sharpen their musical skills. Take some more voice lessons. Sit down and practice the piano. Take up a new instrument. Enroll in an online class. You don't have to look far for opportunities to continue your education. It does, however, require discernment. Perhaps you need to study music in a different style. In 2011, I set out to learn as much as possible about group vocal technique. I was frustrated with myself as a choral director, so I decided to read everything I could get my hands on about choral music. I even watched DVDs and, and took notes on some things. The thirst for knowledge led me to enroll in some online classes through Westminster Choir College for a graduate course in choral pedagogy in um, 2012. The following summer, I attended a conducting institute and I'm, much, I'm a much better conductor because of it. Throughout 2017 and 18, I took online professional development courses through New York Singing Teachers Association. I took classes in vocal anatomy and um, physiology, acoustics and resonance, voice health for voice professionals, singers developmental repertoire and comparative pedagogy. And a comp uh, upon completion of the courses, I'm now a distinguished voice professional through New York Teachers Association. Ironic, since I've never been to New York. <laughs> In the summer of 2019, I even went to a Nats Diction Workshop at St. Olaf. Read as much as you can. Yes, we're going to do the best job we can do in educating you. But commit to being a lifelong learner. The next life lesson, sin sidetracks us. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. One of the things I miss most about living in Georgia and Mississippi are the beautiful trees, except for this campus. This campus has beautiful trees. I live in a neighborhood without any trees. It was basically a clear-cut field, and they just threw up a bunch of houses, and I have a tiny little oak tree that I'm trying to grow in our front yard. My grandmother lived right down the road from us out in the country. She had these massive oak trees in her yard, majestic trees. And one of them in the back had an ivy vine that appeared one day. As it turns out, it was this plant called kudzu. According to the amazing website, Wikipedia, <laughs> where kudzu plants are naturalized, they can be invasive and are considered noxious weeds. The plant climbs over trees and shrubs and grows so rapidly that it kills them by heavy shading. Kudzu's environmental and ecological damage results from its outcompeting other sources um, for a resource. Kudzu competes with the native flora for light and acts to block their access to this vital resource by growing over them and shading them with its leaves. Native plants may then die as a result. At first glance, it seemed pretty harmless. Over time, the ivy began to engulf this towering tree and it became apparent that the ivy was depleting the tree of its life-giving nutrients. My grandmother enlisted the help of a neighbor to come and uh, cut out a six-foot section of that ivy around the base of this huge oak tree. He took an ax and he chopped for hours. The ivy vines were very thick by this time and wrapped themselves around the base of that tree like an octopus squeezing the life out of its prey. Once that six-foot section was cut and pulled away from the tree, the ivy turned brown and eventually died. However, the damage was done to the tree and it would ultimately have to be cut down. Sin looks, feels, smells, and tastes appealing at first. Once sin takes root in our life, however, it drains us of life-giving nutrients we need like the Word of God. 
The ivy took over my grandmother's tree to the point where you could not even see the tree. Sin does the same thing. I try to make a habit of reading uh, through the Bible each year. And each time I read the book of Genesis, I'm astounded when I get to chapter 6. How did things get so bad from chapter 3 to chapter 6 that the Lord had to basically hit a reset button for humanity? The, ample, the answer is very simple, sin. He called on Noah to build an ark for his family and the pairs of animals. Sin destroys everything it touches. 2 Samuel 11 and the chapters that follow show us how sin destroyed everything it touched in David's life. Remember, David was known as a man after God's own heart. Psalm 51 shows David's brokenness over his iniquity. In Psalm 101, uh, 2 and 3, David tells us, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. Throughout the Psalms, David is declaring his dependence upon God to keep him from sin. Some of the darkest days in my life are those that I've allowed sin to choke out the word of God in my own life. I was being disobedient. My young mind rationalized it this way. Since nobody knew my sin and nobody called me out, then it must have been okay. Now I look back and consider the, consider the words of Christ in Matthew 15:8 uh, as he quotes Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but that their heart is far from me. Regular prayers of confession cultivate honesty and openness in our relationship to God. I'm a firm believer in the concept that our corporate worship time should be an overflow of our daily walk with Christ as we spend time in the Word praying for the Holy Spirit to speak truth into our lives. There also has to be a time of confession in our worship. The next life lesson, get over yourself, you're not that important. <laughs> In 1997, I had one of the most important ministry conversations I would ever have. I was about three months into my new position in Roseland Park when the church pianist called me and said she requested a meeting. Meetings are always bad. <laughs> she stopped by the office that Monday morning to discuss the music ministry, and basically she told me I needed to back off. I was a young seminary student in my master's degree, and I was a little gung-ho. I imagine I was a little full of myself. I was pushing Guar a little too far too fast. It was one of those conversations that I look back and I'm very thankful that someone cared enough about me to pull me aside and be honest. We are still friends to this day and she does not remember this conversation. <laughs> As musicians, we are trained to per uh, perfect our craft. We spent out countless hours in practice and ensemble rehearsals and we wanna produce a great product However, it is vital that we look in the mirror and say, get over yourselves. It is so easy to become consumed with what we do that we convince ourselves that the planets and stars might actually revolve around us. John the Baptist taught us that I might de must decrease so that Christ may increase. You need to learn how to laugh at yourself. Sometimes you're going to do something very stupid in front of people, musically speaking. So this one time I was, I was asked to sing the piece of the hymn in the garden. It was for a memorial service at our church. And um, so the, in the hymnal, it's in this key. I come to the garden alone. So I wanted the organist to put it in. I come to the garden alone. Nice key for me. What I thought were half steps on the organ put us here. I come to the garden alone. And so at this point, I'm thinking, have I started in the wrong octave? I know what octave I'm in. It's really high. And one of my friends is back there going, <laughs> You're going to do some things occasionally. You have to learn to laugh at yourself. You have to admit when you're wrong. In a rehearsal, somebody says, I'm not sure that's... Just admit you're wrong and move on. Okay? Very important. Last life lesson. Keep a spiritual journal so you can trace the hand of God in your life. My journals are some of the most treasured things that I own. I call this write it down. 
In my junior year of high school, my English teacher, Miss Mabry, would have us write a paragraph each day in our notebooks. A different student would write a random topic on the board, um, and then she would ask each student to write a paragraph and then read it aloud to the class. She was encouraging us to practice our writing skills together. Writing is a discipline and skill follows drill. Why do we write things down? I think we do it so we'll remember it. I love using computers, smartphones, and tablets. However, if I really want to remember it, I write it down. When I was a junior in college, my best friend Todd would take a notebook, pen, and his Bible and spend 30 minutes each day with God. I observed him doing this each day and quickly realized I should probably be doing this as well because I was watching him grow in his faith. I had done some type of a spiritual journal in high school as I went through a Bible study with my youth group. The earliest journal entries are one or two sentences of scripture reflection. The uh, first scripture that I mention is Psalm 119. In my college years, my journal entries uh, become more reflective and would sometimes fill up a half page and maybe even a full page. As I got busier, my journal entries became shorter with less honesty <laughs> and reflection, and I would simply write down prayer requests and dates. Rebecca and I have moved 12 times. And several years ago, I made sure that I put all these journals in a separate box and labeled it so I wouldn't lose them because they are some of my most treasured possessions. My spiritual journey is actually a collection of about 10 notebooks and diaries of various shapes and sizes that date back 31 years. The earliest entry is dated October 17, 1989. I was 16 years old and well into my junior year of high school, and I've done my best to keep it continuous, although there are several gaps. I try to journal each time I have a devotional time with God. Keeping a spiritual journal is a, is a way we can trace the hand of God at work in our lives over a period of time. We can observe a constant pattern of need, prayer, and provision. Keeping a spiritual journal will help you chart the bigger picture in your life. Reading through my entire journal, I, I can see myself working through large processes at school, or work, such as a dissertation or accreditation self-study, twice, paying off debt, buying, selling homes, and coping with uh, Rebecca's health issues. In January 2017, I sat down and reflected over the blessings and struggles of 2016. If we don't chart where we are and where we have been, how, we will, how will we know where we are headed? In my own strength and intellect, I try to assess and evaluate my life family, finances, teaching, ministry. When I read the Word of God, the Spirit of God inspects my life and measures it against the standard of God's Word. Journaling each day gives us an opportunity to write down an honest reflection of our lives. I'm not pretending that everything in my life is perfect. I'm, I'm acknowledging where I fail and how Christ is growing me in my faith. I encourage each of you to start journaling. All you need all you need is a Bible, a notebook, and a pen. Make sure you date each entry so you can keep things in perspective of when they happen. Sometimes we simply need a reminder of how God is moving in our lives. The last lesson um, that I put on this list um, is called Lessons from Family. And I said, your family is your greatest ministry. When Rebecca and I got married, we said the traditional vows, and if um, I, we survive until May, it'll be 24 years. Most of us can relate to the part about being rich or poor. I was, <laughs> I was going to be a seminary student. I could relate to being poor. <laughs> Nothing in life prepares you for that other phrase in sickness and in health. Our daughter, Sydney, was born on August the 24th, 2007. Two weeks later, we would take her to a doctor's appointment. Moments later, we ended up in a hospital across the street. The nurses were able to get an IV into her arm. Hours later, we were headed to a memorial hospital in Savannah where they had a real children's hospital. Life comes to a screeching halt when one of your children is in that shape. Before she was transferred to Savannah, I made a mad dash home to get some clothes for the journey. I was calling my dad to tell him what was going on and I was suddenly driven to my knees. I was speechless. I was at the end of my rope. After a few minutes, I gathered my senses, quickly stopped by the college, which was really close, and to just confirm Sydney was on my health insurance, knowing what we were about to endure. She didn't even have a social security number. You don't get one of those for a few weeks later. 
back at the hospital while we were waiting for my pastor, um, while we were waiting, my pastor rounded the corner to come check on us. Now, as a minister, I had done dozens of hospital visits. I actually like hospital visits. This time was different. Now I was the one being visited and I lost it. It was real. Sydney was diagnosed with a urinary tract infection, which is deadly for an infant. She spent several days in pediatric ICU and then was transferred to a home, to a room where they administered IV antibiotics. Rebecca stayed with her throughout that entire 11 day ordeal. I was back and forth driving back and forth to the hospital. And during one of those times, Rebecca's mom was with Clay. And while I was running the roads, I started singing this anthem, Cast Thy Burden Upon the Lord, setting of Psalm 56. The verse says, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. That song had become part of my life soundtrack. That scripture had been seared into my heart and mind through choral music. Now the question was, will I cast this burden upon the Lord and will I trust him to sustain us? Every time I tell this story, I have to make sure I tell the rest of it. Sydney made a full recovery and life went on, but not without giving us one of the biggest scares of our lives. Our family moved on to North Georgia in the last days of 09. My teaching position at Bruton Parker had come to an abrupt halt. However, God provided this wonderful teaching opportunity at Trent McConnell. And sometime in January, I had left town for a couple of days and Rebecca was out on a snowy, icy day, taking our German Shepherd Bella out for a walk. Bella yanked Rebecca on all of a sudden, causing her to injure her right knee. Later, she would have meniscus surgery. Over the past three years, Rebecca's eyesight had been declining. She'd gone to several doctors, but nobody could help. They simply gave her stronger glasses and contact prescriptions. We missed the signs. After her knee surgery, her, she began physical therapy, but her knee just wouldn't heal. Her knee was bothering her so much, uh, that walking because it was becoming more difficult. Finally, her surgeon said, you got to go to a neurologist. By the time she went to see the neurologist, her, her walking had gotten worse. And they said, yeah, you probably have what's called transverse myelitis. We went on a date to celebrate our 15th anniversary that May. By then, she needed a rolling walker with handbrakes just to get around. And on the way back from the restaurant, she looked at me. She said, I have something to tell you. She said, I can't walk. I don't know why, but I cannot walk. Something is wrong. We refer to this time as the downward spiral. At the time, we were living in a home with three floors. Just getting to the bedroom was a challenge. I had scheduled a trip to Kentucky with the Georgia Baptist All-State Youth Choir. I was, do I go? Do I stay? I decided to ask my good friend Becky to stay with Rebecca and, and keep an eye on her while I went on. I was on the trip about four days when I received the call to come back immediately. Rebecca had been hospitalized. I managed to get home by borrowing a friend's company vehicle. It was a hysterical trip. I was in Kentucky, I kept getting lost, and you keep driving through these things called blast zones where rocks may fall on you. Anyway, that's all the story in itself. When I made it to the hospital, my friend Becky told me the news. Rebecca had been diagnosed with MS. Again, life came to a screeching halt. Now, all of a sudden, everything that had plagued her for the last three or four years uh, made sense. Deteriorating eyesight, mobility. Her, di her mother had been diagnosed with MS in her late 30s as well, as well. She was given IV steroids, bounced back rather well. By August, it seemed perhaps this was in remission. In September of 11, 2011, she received a flu shot, sent her back down on the downward spiral. We eventually moved out of the three-floor home into a rental house on one level. Fast forward five years later, and Rebecca got a powered wheelchair and a handicap-accessible van. We made sure our home was handicap-accessible. Things have settled down. This is our new normal. In sickness and in health, that's what we said in, on May the 25th, 1996. In Old Testament times, vows were irreversible. When you read the Old Testament, notice that. When we got married, the Lord expected us, he expects us to stay married until one of us dies. Vows are serious. Our family is our greatest ministry. I've had the amazing privilege of leading both of our children to Christ and personally baptizing them. Those were both amazing moments. My children are now 12 and 14. 
And when I originally wrote this, they would still hold my hand when we went to Walmart. That's not the same. <laughs> Along with Rebecca, they are the most important people on this earth to me. I pray over them each day when I let them out at school. I remind them each day that they are made in the image of God and that Christ loves them very much, as do their parents. And then I quote one of my favorite verses out of the Psalms, Psalm 1914. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. They are my greatest ministry. In closing, sometimes lessons are learned in humorous ways. Sometimes lessons leave scars. My dad once told me that there is no education in the second kick of a mule. <laughs> I do not wish to repeat my mistakes, especially those in ministry. Perhaps someone else can learn from my mistakes and then not repeat.